PhD candidate at the University of Otago. I'm honored to be uh, chair of this uh, event today. So we will be hearing today the wonderful presentations from the established experts and scholars in the field. Uh, we will be hearing first the keynote address by Anthony Borden, who is IWPR Executive Director. Uh, he will be giving a keynote speech on this very important and pressing uh, topic of today's uh, situation. Then we will be listening to uh, Dr. Rashid Gabdulhakov, who is Assistant Professor at the Center for Media and Journalism Studies, University of Groningen. Uh, he, in his speech, he will cover Sputnik News Agency's propaganda strategies in the regions of Central Asia. Uh, then we will proceed to listen to the presentation delivered by uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher Schwartz, who is postdoctoral research associate at Ro Rochester Institute of Technology, Global Cybersecurity Institute. Uh, he will be speaking on the principles of counter uh, of countering disinformation. His topic uh, is titled as follows. He will be talking about building a deep fake detector. Uh, this is something very intriguing. Then we will proceed to listen uh, to Rustam Gulov, who is the media trainer and consultant, co-founder of Tajikistan's first fact-checking platform, factcheck.tj. Uh, he will be talking on the impact of the pro-war propaganda uh, on the population of the Central Asian countries. And we will end with uh, Dr. Farhot Talipov, who is director of the Education and Research Institution, uh, Knowledge Caravan. Uh, he will share the lesson learned from propaganda's impact on Uzbekistan. I cannot hear for uh, hear all of your presentations. Uh, I'm sure we will have more clarity in this complicated topic after today's panel. Uh, let me also touch briefly some uh, housekeeping rules, some uh, some technical regulations of this meeting. Uh, so first, we are holding this uh, event, this our today's uh, expert meeting on record, and sometimes we're taking additional uh, snapshots of it. So in case if you are not comfortable with this, please kindly inform us, uh, inform the IWPR staff by writing in the chat box that you uh, in the chat box directly to them. They, they have the IWPR in their nicknames. Uh, however, of course, we would appreciate if you stay with your cameras on so that we have a sense of being together in this very divided world. Uh, then a uh, second point of our housekeeping is please drop your questions to the chat box here uh, in Zoom. And during the event, of course, we will be reading them out uh, when there is a time for Q and A sessions. Uh, third item is that we understand the complexity of the topic. It is a very divisive topic, the propaganda, the war in Ukraine, the Russian propaganda in Central Asia. And we understand that people may uh, have strong feelings about it. I urge each and everyone in the audience joining our uh, Zoom uh, meeting today to remain civil to remain civil, ask questions uh, during the Q&A session, and abide by gender and conflict sensitivity. We have to be uh, sensitive and sensible uh, to each other positions. Uh, finally, we're providing simultaneous interpretation during the event. So it's not only going to be uh, English language here. Uh, uh, right now, I will address the Russian speaking audience. Мы обеспечиваем синхронный перевод во время данного мероприятия, поэтому если вы хотите переключиться с английского языка на русский язык, выберите русский язык на нижней панели в Zoom, там есть значок «Глобус», щелкните по нему, по, по, на нем. Если у вас возникли проблемы, пожалуйста, напишите нашим представителям. Опять же, представители, они имеют отметку IWPR у них в никнеймах, и дайте об этом знать им. Uh, so, on this moment, uh, on this point, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm passing now the floor to the keynote uh, speaker, uh, uh, the, uh, Anthony Borden, who is IWPR Executive Director. So, the floor is yours. You will have 10 minutes, and I will give you a notice one minute before the time is over. Thank you. Okay, Dimitri, thank you so much. And just by the way, you introduced the uh, discussion. It shows the seriousness, the seriousness of purpose, the great organizing and the team effort behind all this. And uh, uh, I, I'm always so impressed and so delighted to uh, to cooperate with our wonderful Central Asia team. And it's great to have you back. It's terrific. Welcome to everybody. It's great to have such interest in this topic. 
Um, it, we really believe that by facilitating such exchanges, we can strengthen the capacity of civil society and independent media to confront the really vital challenges facing Central Asia. And as you said today, our topic is war propaganda and hate speech. I just want to quickly note that this meeting is part of our series, uh, the program Amplify, Verify, and Exchange Information for Democratization and Good Governance in Eurasia. It gives me yet just one more opportunity to thank our most wonderful and generous and long-standing friends at the Nor Royal Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We thank them so much for their uh, their support, their enthusiasm, their uh, generosity, and their long-term strategic vision. And uh, we just love having them as a partner, and we look forward to more events such as this and other work together in the future. And of course, I want to take just a brief moment to thank uh, all the Central Asia team at Audit PR. Sadly, I, many of you I don't know, but some of you I do, and I always admire the work as much as we can follow it and indeed keep up with you. Their, their job is to combat disinformation in the most creative way by strengthening the capacity of local voices to overcome Russian media. And just a quick shout out to Olga Begaim, Akalai, Jazgul, Nargiza, and of course, my old and dear friend Abahan, who's reserved. I think he's got allergies today or some other excuse why he's making me speak more than, than maybe he would in some of these instances. But it's just a chance again to thank, to thank them all and congratulate them all for the great work. And of course, to welcome everyone to this important conversation. So IWPR, the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, is a global not-for-profit working to strengthen local voices in areas of crisis, conflict, and transition. By giving voice, we drive positive social change. Our headline topic these days, the topic I believe should be everyone's headline, is the global threat of disinformation. It's really the scourge of our time. It's the challenge which prevents us from resolving all other challenges. It's the thing that divides us. It drives conflict and hatred. It undermines our collective capacity to find solutions, whether from war and peace to the economy and the climate. It's for these reasons that we believe that disinformation is our gravest immediate single challenge. Globally, we are beset with a profound transformation of the media landscape. Decades ago, there was dominant top-down media and media gatekeepers. The challenge was to diversify and bring in other voices. In the early years of our work, not long after the fall of the Berlin Wall, that was our original concept. Now we have the splintering of everything and the onslaught of malinformation from a thousand indeed tens and tens of thousands of sources. Social media has made everyone a content producer and everyone is part of the information free for all. But the grave and particular challenge for those of us who believe in international law, human rights and free and responsible information is this, the landscape is unequal. In democracies and among people who believe in democracy, we believe in open information, the competition of ideas, and the rule of law. There are some standards and some expectations. I'm not saying that these are not violated. I'm not saying there are not problems. There are tons of problems. But there are some fundamental assumptions and some ground rules. IWPR's own ethical international standards of journalism and analytical research are a part of that. The same is not true for others in this space. That includes China, and especially for the purposes of this discussion, Russia. We can say that the mindset of information management has not fundamentally shifted from the Soviet period. Media and communications are fully considered as part of political and ideological campaigns. The information war and the military war are one and the same. As you will know better than I, turning to Central Asia and Russia's near abroad, what Russia effectively considers its home sphere, Russia has been producing disinformation and driving propaganda narratives for decades. Soft power combines with subversion, subversion bullying, and pressure, including pushing people and institutions into self-censorship. The aim is to compel behavior at home and manipulate opinion and politics abroad. This is called sharp power. 
These narratives had a set of common characteristics and features. Traditional themes, such as Russia being the victim, the inevitable collapse of Western culture, the promotion of traditional values, the polarization between them and us. There may be a lot of contradiction in the narratives and unofficial and official statements, but that doesn't matter. Confusion and disorientation are part of the objective. In any way, there is no accountability. With the beginning of the war in Ukraine, those narratives were adopted to support the agenda. It's the big lie combined with distorted history mixed in with a dizzying array of victimization, emotive manipulation, and fear-mongering. The big lie is the driver of this catastrophic war, built in the realm of competing truths, different truths, what the Moscow propagandist Alexander Dugan calls our special Russian truth, truth not as facts, but as belief. The Maidan revolution is a coup, Russia did not control or supply the forces that shot down Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, killing 298 people. The bodies in Bucha and other suburbs of Kyiv, some of which I have seen with my own eyes, these were put there by the Ukrainian government. It is not Ukraine facing existential threat, but Russia. Let us be clear, the overarching narrative here is that Ukraine is not a legitimate independent state. Ukrainian language is not real. Ukrainian people do not exist. Numerous official and quasi-official publications and broadcasts promulgate what are such effectively and sometimes explicitly genocidal statements. This material is broadcast through TV and radio programming, new media and social media operations, conferences aimed at proving these narratives and influencing the audience and the public at large. Vast networks of false websites have been identified, and many of them taken down by Meta Facebook, including websites mimicking major Western media, such as The Guardian and Der Spiegel. The targets are not only the Eurasian region, but also Western Europe, including Germany, France, the UK, Italy, and of course, Ukraine. These false narratives and distortion flood Central Asia especially, which is highly dependent on Russia both economically and politically. Russian television is broadcasting in all Central Asian countries and is free to watch. This propaganda is causing a split in the societies in Central Asia. Families were broken, friends never speak again, colleagues avoid each other. On social media, there are information bubbles divided by the position and the side that people support. The very same thing has happened, of course, in Ukraine, families divided between the two countries, and in some cases within Ukraine itself, such as between long-standing occupied territories. Propaganda works to activate psychological reaction, and the propagandists manipulate the mood of society. The propagandists create the comfort zone in which the viewer agreeing with them appears in a world where everything a viewer believes stands true. That is why it is so difficult to free people from the embraces of propaganda. In occupied areas of Ukraine, it is magnified by social isolation, hardship, and a complete domination by Russian disinformation of the information sphere. Migrants may, migrants may be especially vulnerable. They are tricked to participate in army and military actions by being promised Russian citizenship. The pro-war propaganda promotes military narratives that may undermine political stability as the split in society grows and there, there is a Soviet nostalgia among segments of the population. The war fever itself is energizing, upsetting, and destabilizing. Even late in the shelling of Mariupol, some residents still claim that they were being shelled by Ukrainian forces. The force of Russian emotive media is so strong as, in, as a Ukrainian in Odessa told me, if I watched it for too long, I would want to kill Ukrainians, he said. The core of wartime propaganda is to instigate hatred for the enemy and support for Russia, the motherland and its allies, and for the war itself. A recent post-mobilization Russian exodus brings another threat, as many migrants or those running away from war do not necessarily oppose the politics of the Kremlin. 
Many of them escaped to Central Asia and continue spreading the same propaganda of war and hate. Other narratives are brought into play, selling an imperial war by deploying anti-imperialist and anti-colonial language against the West and NATO, particularly in developing countries in Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. So what is the answer to all this? The first thing is to recognize it and label it. IWPR has coordinated a major research program into Chinese sharp power globally. We know it is a strategy, it is a plan, it is coordinated, it is well-resourced, and it is serious. The second thing is to understand that it will take dedication and a long-term strategy to combat. This includes government action to regulate the information landscape and ensure fair play and exclude influence from nefarious and destabilizing external actors. This will be possible in some countries, but not in others. It includes technology firms to grapple with the global scale of disinformation and misinformation. Again, some platforms will and can grapple with it. Others will not. None will do so adequately. It also includes the public at large. Media literacy, critical readers, diverse reading, informed consumption, breaking out of information bubbles, especially on social media. The world has taken profound steps to combat COVID and shown that we can respond. With global information viruses rampant, we all have to contribute to building a more hygienic information landscape. Finally, and where IWPR comes in and so do you, we can produce more and better information. IWPR offers a range of learning opportunities by our, uh, on our amazing online courses on disinformation. These can be found at the Cabar Asia uh, website in the Media School, including forthcoming new educational material that will soon be available for free. The purpose of all of this? To do our part to build critical thinking. That is the very key. To research, report, analyze, and write seriously, carefully, and responsibly. Avoid emotive responses. Seek as much as possible to cross borders and build information bridges. Needless to say, always reject hate speech and racism and calls to any kind of prejudice, much less violence. And above all, accept and indeed welcome disagreement. This is normal, but stick to facts and seek to build a common reality, a shared and actual truth on which responsible public debate can and should flourish. This is the way we can combat disinformation, leave aside manufactured conflict, and begin to solve our real challenges. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony. That was a really, uh, I don't know, eye-opening speech from you about what kind of the crisis we're living in right now, that we are undergoing the crisis of the post-truth society. You were mentioning that uh, Russia is uh, creating a different kind of truth uh, about, about whether those people in Bucha were real or were not, they not real. So in this pl plurality of the different truths, the approach that you were arguing for, which is recognizing propaganda and labeling it, is something that I think is very important. And uh, I think that uh, this is something that our next speaker, uh, Rashid Gabdul Haka, will be covering in his uh, talk. Uh, so now I give the floor to Rashid Gabdul Hakov, who is assistant professor at Center for Media and Journalism Studies, uh, University of Groningen, who will cover Sputnik news agencies propaganda strategies in the uh, in the central asian region uh, i give the, the floor is yours you have 10 minutes thank you thank you so much dmitry i would also like to express my sincere gratitude to everyone who organized this panel to iwpr uh, to kabar asia we have a long history of collaboration it has always been very rewarding and pleasing and look forward to future collaborations as well a quick disclaimer while i'm really honored to be part of this important timely panel i, I wish a greater gender balance could have been achieved so i hope one way we can solve these uh mansplaining men also <laughs> is that is by involving uh people in the discussion actively yes yeah? so please uh let's let's uh, get involved and co-create knowledge Propaganda is a, such a vast term. It's you know uh, that we can spend 
hours, if not weeks, talking about it. And as, as an educator, I can definitely. But um, today I want to focus on just a few snapshots. So please treat these as such. Yeah, the idea is not to provide a comprehensive picture, but just to stress what's out there um, and what's important. So I will start with some questions. What is propaganda? We have to understand what we are talking about before we can proceed. I will elaborate on why the Russian propaganda matters particularly globally and in the context of Central Asia. I will share some concrete examples that will come from the platform Sputnik. And at the end, I would like to instigate a discussion on what must be done in reaction to these propaganda strategies. There are many definitions to propaganda. It's like culture. Yeah? How do you define culture? 50 different explanations. I offer you mine. I define propaganda as a multimodal, multi-semiotic and multi-tool communication strategy, which is aimed at impacting the way people perceive reality. By multimodality, I mean the different forms of communication, not just language, but also image, references to culture. It's multi-semiotic. And in the image here, I have um, uh, selected the Ramadan prayer in Bishkek under the statue of Lenin. This is also discourse. This is the colonial discourse of Russia. It's the Soviet history that is still on a daily basis, 30 years down the road. While we are constructing arguments that we have outlived post-Sovietism, we live in a Soviet-informed reality. And the message, of course, is conveyed through a variety of platforms and through a variety of tools on which will, I will elaborate. But the key point is that it impacts the way people perceive reality. We are conditioned to think of propaganda as something negative. But propaganda is usually very well crafted and is exciting in all reality. It's an entertainment product sometimes. It's also an emotional product that triggers certain sentiments in people. So we are dealing with propaganda, which is very well crafted. Why does it matter for Central Asia? Exactly because of this historical impact. We are conditioned to think about certain values. One example I can use is the so-called Great Patriotic War, the victory of World War II, which is a historical taboo, a topic no one dares to discuss or challenge, and a topic which is now used to justify war in Ukraine. Propaganda is in the daily language, in daily discourses that we use. It's in the humor and all these jokes that uh, we remember from the Soviet times that marginalized the peoples that were believed to have lived in a uh, peaceful and unified society. Propaganda has also to, has to do with sentiments, nostalgia, certain rituals. Every evening, families come together in front of TV still to turn on those programs that ha they have been watching since the 90s, that give them the sense of belonging, the sense of reality. And through these programs, or along with them, comes the political agenda from Russia that educates people on who is the enemy and or how they should go about their lives. And many of them justify war as well. There are certain cultural codes that are ingrained and weaved into this propaganda that make it difficult to track. Central, audience, Central Asian audiences are also exposed to propaganda at home in Central Asia, in the region, but also while being in migration in Russia. Yeah, that's where it's, it gets even more amplified. And as Anthony Borden rightly note, noted, now propaganda has also traveled with the relocants, with people running from mobilization. Pro-Kremlin discourses penetrate through a variety of domains, TV, newspapers, books, websites, social media, yeah, word of mouth. Moreover, our leaders in Central Asia seem to be actively adopting the repressive practices that are in place in Russia, where the civil society has been completely cracked down upon in, uh, in um, the media reality that I describe as the digital Iron Curtain. Yeah, in the Soviet times, there was the Iron Curtain that isolated Russia from the outside world. Putin regime is actively installing a digital version of that. And unfortunately, some of these malpractices are copied in the region as well. What are some concrete examples from Sputnik? Sputnik is an interesting platform. They are developed in 2014 uh, with the aim of broadcasting the 
Kremlin ag political agenda broadly to global audiences in over 30 languages, including local languages of Central Asia. It's quite active. Uh, so there is a certain level of convergence. Yeah. So it's quite active on different platforms, including social media platforms. What are some of the narratives? Again, out of many, I chose a few that I would like to offer a snapshot over. Demonization of the so-called collective West. Yeah, almost. So if, if Central Asian states are, are, are there to build a healthy relationship with, with Europe, with the United States, then this is challenged when the West is constantly demonized, when it's portrayed as the enemy with these narratives of conspiracy. Another level of discourse that I noticed in, in my research uh, on Sputnik, well, Russian propaganda more broadly, but Sputnik specifically, is the demonization of Ukraine. Ukraine, Ukrainian leadership, and Ukrainian people. Demonization and dehumanization of Ukrainians. Glorification of Russia and Putin, perhaps an obvious one. Endorsement of domestic state leaders, an interesting balance in the narrative. So on the one hand, pitching to the leaders, while getting their agenda across, but also customized reporting on border conflicts. And I'll show you some uh, examples in the form of screenshots that I took. So with the first example, the demonization of the collective West, again, out of many, just one vivid example. Look at this one. The US money is spent on teaching the youth how to overthrow the government. So the, the US, the UN, <laughs> the European Union, the, the NATO are always framed in a sense that they're taking kids to some obscure conferences abroad, teach them how to be revolutionary forces and insert these engines back in the society. Therefore, we should have no trust in people who have any connection with Western partners. And we can see how, how that echoes now, uh, let's say Kyrgyzstan specifically, yeah, with, the, with the repression of civil society leaders, with the uh, deportation of, of uh, Balot Timirov, and with, with the pressure that is being put on, on alternative voices. Demonizing Ukraine and recruiting Central Asians into the Russian military. Some of the reports talk about the wonderful opportunities for Central Asians to join the Russian military and to make money. And of course, we can dedicate quite a bit of time on talking about the vulnerabilities of Central Asians to these discourses, their vulnerable position at home and in Russia on which the, the government of uh, the, the Kremlin regime, but also the media are pressing on the, the sentiments. On the one hand, with a reward, yeah, easy path towards the Russian passport, maybe some extra income. And on the other hand, with fear as well, with threats of deportation. Yet there is a level of customized reporting. And if we take a look at the most recent border well, the, well, the way the, the type of words we can we use here also matter, yeah. Border incident or border clash, some called it the mini war. But if we notice, Sputnik is pitching these narratives in a customary customary manner. If we look, look at uh, Sputnik Kyrgyzstan and Sputnik Tajikistan, Sputnik Kyrgyzstan discourses are accusing the Tajik side of igniting the conflict, of starting the fight first. And Sputnik Tajikistan is doing exactly the opposite. So this is an interesting observation because if Russia is positioning itself as a potential mediator in this conflict, well, then the state-sponsored broadcaster is doing exactly <laughs> the, the, uh, all the steps to ignite international hatred in the region. What should be done in reaction? A total ban on Russian media sources may not be plausible. That's a, that's a empty wish that we can talk about in, in a Dmitry, I see you waving, I will wrap up shortly. It's an empty wish that we can elaborate on in our policy reports, but without concrete smaller steps, that overarching one cannot be achieved. What are some smaller steps that can be taken? Well, they're actually major, but in comparison, alternative messages. Alternative messages must be generated and disseminated. They must also be multimodal and multisemiotic. Yeah, through different platforms, through different triggers, emotional, sentimental, entertaining, etc. And they need to be delivered in different languages, in the local languages of Central Asia, but also in the Russian language. I will stop here.
Uh, many, many, many thanks to you, Rashid. That was such a pleasure to listen to this fantastic presentation. Uh, really, a lot of what you said is really uh, just uh, opens a curtain into how the Russian propaganda works. What are the narratives? This is very important to understand it. And while listening to you, I was all thinking about recently coming at this movie, which, which is called, maybe the audience knows it, it's a very famous movie of uh, director Balabanov. It's called Brat and Brat 2. And I just, uh, in, right now in 2022, when the war in Ukraine is ra rages on, I was just uh, watching at how the Ukrainian uh, community is portrayed in this movie and how are portrayed other nationalities, which are also present in the territory of Russian Federation, how are they portrayed and the way that this negative treatment of these others is hardwired into the whole psyche of the viewers is just fascinating it's very interesting but now uh, we're living in the 21st century and there are so many technical innovations and in, in a way of like how can the propaganda be hidden so that uh, sometimes it's not as obvious for example as it's uh, as it is in Balabanov's movies and I think that the next speaker who is Christopher Schwartz, will help us to understand uh, what are the principles of countering the disinformation, and he can share his uh, uh, perception of what is the deep fake detector, how it works, and how can we apply it to fight Russian disinformation. Thank you. Uh, Christopher, you have 10 minutes, and you can okay, start. Okay, let me see by showing my minutes. screen. Um... Can everyone see it? Yes, we can Great. see it. So first, uh, thank you to Olga in particular for hunting me down for this opportunity. Uh, it's been a little bit complex getting me here. That's also why my topic is not exactly the same as what I'm listed in on the agenda. Uh, secondly, I'm not necessarily going to be presenting my own research. I'm, I'm presenting some composite research of, of myself and uh, a team I had recently joined called the Defake Project. The presentation I'm going to give you is derived on other presentations with a little bit of my own added input by my two supervisors in the project. So um, we are looking into deep fakes. So what is a deep fake? Uh, a deep fake can be considered an artificially generated audiovisual rendering. It's a very fancy description. It will be clear in a moment what I mean by that. Uh, it is usually created without the consent of the target uh, and it is getting harder and harder to detect. This is a deep fake. If any of you are fans of Star Wars and you have seen the Mandalorian, then the representation of Luke Skywalker, a young Luke Skywalker played by Mark Hamill, that was a deep fake. Disney is actually a corporation that has advanced very far in this technology. Mark Hamill, the actor, I believe is now in his 70s. So we have seen, if you're a fan of Star Wars, you have seen an actual example of a deep fake recently. So deep fakes um, are often used in pornography, again, with or without consent, typically without consent. And it's believed that this is actually where they originated historically. Uh, they can also be used for art and entertainment, like the example from Disney right here. But they also have political and military uses, which is, I think, the aspect of most collective concern. Um, so vectors of deep fakes, what do I mean by that? So right now, the current emphasis on the generation of deepfakes, both by adversaries, which includes governments, corporations, and individual actors, and by defenders, those of us who are trying to deal with the problem, is on manipulating faces. Here we have an example of, of Obama and Putin. Um, the manipulations of entire scenes are fairly difficult, but they are possible. Um, so this is an example from um, a New Zealand defense force in Afghanistan in which the audio was swapped out um, to create more of a sort of a chaotic crisis scene. Um, and it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a blurry area. Some consider it a deep fake, some don't. Um, but the point is, is that the ability to actually like manufacture an entire battle scene, for example, we're not at that point yet. Although you might hear um, a discourse especially from governments involved in the Ukrainian war, that this is already going on. So there are several kinds of deep fakes, but the one that is most concerning, the two that are most concerning for us uh, in the deep fake project are what are called face swaps and puppet masters. So uh, a face swap we have seen, there's this famous example from TikTok of Tom Cruise's face being put onto the face of an actor who had a very similar facial structure and who could simulate his uh, voice patterns. 
So you have probably seen it. But this is not Tom Cruise. This is an actor with his face on it. Nice little threat there. Okay, so that again, that was not actually Tom Cruise. In case you haven't seen uh, this video, it's a, it's a, it's Tom Cruise's face put onto that of an actor. Then there's the puppet master. So the puppet master is a very different technique. It takes an actually already existing photograph or video of a person and manipulates that to get them to speak or do do something that an underlying actor imitating them wants them to do. So there's a famous uh, video going around on YouTube with Barack Obama. Uh, Christopher, sorry. Uh, do yeah. we need the audio for for this? Oh, it's okay. We can we can go ahead. That's the there. There's that's the only two uh, audio examples. So um, we have seen actually some puppet masters being used already in military applications. There was this famous video of Zelensky, for example, that's going around. This was not done very well. Uh, everyone could very clearly see that it was a manipulation. Um, so, and this is not the only example in Ukraine war. There's been, there have been examples of it on, on both sides going back and forth. This was targeting the Ukrainian side. Okay, so the dangers posed by deep fakes. Uh, obviously they can magnify misinformation or disinformation. They can themselves be sources of such misinformation. Um, they potentially undermine the credibility and the journalists who report it, as well as the authorities in general. It, it creates this it, it engenders more of this paranoid atmosphere in audiences. Uh, it can falsely manipulate the emotions and opinions of audiences. Um, and of course, it can lead to organized public action based on false ideas and impressions. Public action here has to be understood to be as much about audiences um, uh, like you and I as army, for example. If a, if a military, for example, sees a tweet uh, from their commander in chief telling them to stand down and they don't have a good command and control structure, there's a chance that they may they may stop their act, their action, right? While they're trying to figure out whether the broadcast was real or not. So uh, these are some of the uh, dangers posed by them. Um, and they're also easy-ish to produce. Um, so you do need a lot of technical skills and computational power uh, and craftsmanship to produce a good one, but it doesn't necessarily take a lot to produce a not so good one um, and still accomplish your purpose. And moreover, we are, we are not far from a period, it's, there's different speculations about how long, a decade or two, before we have uh, almost visually perfect deep fakes. So um, deep fakes prey on audience susceptibility and there are certain conditions that lead to audience susceptibility. So first off, it is often hidden where comes a, a deep fake, the provenance of a deep fake. Um, they just sometimes appear um, in the void, as it were. Uh, we don't know where they came from. The metadata has been has been stripped, uh, and it is it's it's unknown who produced it and for what purpose. Um, audiences obviously lack a lot of media literacy, which makes them more vulnerable when they see something like this. Um, if it's if a deepfake is injected into an emotionally intense media environment, especially where the perceptions of an existential threat, then it can really explode. And by what I mean is basically when an audience feels that it is it is under a threat, it is under attack, like in war conditions, but not necessarily. Um, when there's also conditions of social economic precariousness, so when people feel like their livelihoods are in danger and they cannot accomplish the lives they want, which at this point is a pretty universal feeling, whether in advanced capitalist economies or in societies like Central Asia. Um, a, a lack of trust in journalists and authorities, which again is a very universal uh, feeling it now. So um, this is where we come in. Uh, we have been doing uh, studies with journalists to develop this tool, the deepfake detector. Uh, this user interface you're seeing is still under development. We will not be using exactly this. Part of, part of why I was brought onto the team, I'm a former journalist, 
uh, is to help them develop the UI, the user interface, in a way that will be more effective. Um, but the basic idea is um, when an image appears, a, a video image that is believed to be deep fake, um, it is put into this detector, which then processes and sort of tells you if this image or video is a deep fake, I would be worried about these features of the video. And it will, it will look at the features of the video. If you look closely, the man on the right is not James Bond, but it is Elon Musk. So the deep fake detector is saying it is 93% likely fake. Okay, but building a tool is not enough. We need to build a community around the tool. Um, so very often what happens is there's a, lot, there's a lot of good research done into ways of countering deep fakes and other forms of disinformation, but they're dropped sort of in a void or they're given to a newsroom here or there, and they just are not able to build up the habits of using these things effectively. So we need to build a community around it. Um, so toward that end, uh, one of our team members, he's actually a PhD student, is building an actual platform um, where, where newsrooms and individual journalists and other users can communicate with each other, share insights and information, and use a tool more effectively. Uh, we need to increase our user studies, which is why I'm very glad to be invited here, because I would love to invite a lot of you and your colleagues to come on board and help us to develop this uh, more strongly and to eventually be members of the user platform. Um, we need to expand the use cases. So we've been focusing on journalists at the moment, but we might be expanding beyond that professional class to include other ones, including uh, members of government. Um, and uh, I can stop here or I can talk about uh, spotting deep fakes. So what you actually need to look for in a deep fake and what we are looking for. Um, uh, how much time do I actually have, Dimitri? You have one minute, you have one oh, minute left. This is a perfect point to stop then. It's also, okay. I can't see you on my screen. I only see my screen. So it's hard for me to judge your reactions to if I'm talking too fast, for example, you know. We're, we're, you, we're enjoying every word. Wonderful. Okay, we can stop yeah. then. And later on, if you want to talk about um, what we call the actual artifacts, uh, we can discuss that. And, and if I was going too fast, feel free to ask me a question and I'll go back over it again, no problem. Thank you very much, Christopher. Yeah, I think that uh, the audience, all the guests of the meeting, they have no moral right just to let Christopher go on this note without actually sharing uh, sharing with us how can we actually, like as a users, identify the deep fake video. Uh, because you just left us with one uh, final picture where there, there was something wrong with the eye. And I was like, yeah, there is something wrong with that picture. That must be a deep fake. So I hope we return back to your this uh, point later on in in a Q&A session. Uh, and, but now I would like to give the floor to our next uh, presenter, who I had the pleasure to be in the same trainings with, who I observed teaching the local uh, journalists and others, uh, local uh, tutors of journalism as well, on how to use uh, different tools to understand whether they have they are dealing with fakes. For example, I remember Rustam was telling how to use the reverse Google search for the pictures just to understand whether they are completely fake or not. Uh, so uh, that's my uh, pleasure to give now the floor to Rustam Gulov, who is media trainer and consultant, co-founder of Tajikistan first fact-checking platform, factcheck.tj. Uh, he will be talking about the impact of pro-war propaganda on the population of Central Asia. Thank you. You have 10 minutes. Oh, thank you. I try to be uh, as quick as uh, it's possible. Thank you very much for all organizers of this event. And I really uh, want to thank you uh, to, to the previous uh, speakers because I really enjoyed their speech, their, their presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, regarding to the uh, Russian propaganda and it's how it influenced uh, the audience of the Central Asia, especially uh, audience of the Tajikistan, because I'm here and I live here and mostly uh, cooperate with our local media and see how the people is changing uh, and the pressure of this propaganda here in, uh, in my country. But uh, I see this uh, change on the world, the perception of the world among the all, all the people in Central Asia. It's it's pretty the same, and it's some it has some similarities because uh, when we talk about Russian propaganda, I want to focus about on uh, mostly on uh, TV channels, Russian TV channels, because it's one of the most. Uh, it, um, uh, most most popular 
uh, source of information, source of news for the uh, mostly uh, the elder generation, but it doesn't mean that only elder generation consume uh, news from uh, TV channels and the youngest one are consuming it from the internet. No, it's not true, but, but mostly the elder generation because of this, uh, the, 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 there are some historical, some, some uh, reasons by some uh, nostalgia about their uh, uh, young younger age and the, the Soviet Union nostalgia by on the Soviet Union they they mostly use uh, this uh, Russian Russian TV channels as a news source for example in uh, uh, Tajikistan around ninety percent of the of the people uh, aged. Uh, uh, 60 plus or uh, they consume news from Russian TV channels and at nine nine out nine channels out of top 10 the most popular TV channels in Tajikistan are Russian uh, Russian TV channels and the, the number 10 is uh, Euronews all others are the Russian uh, uh, TV channels which all of them are the part of the Russian propaganda even some uh, so-called independent still independent so like like NTV it's but it's, uh, uh, also is uh, under Russian government uh, I don't know guiding let's call it but they they also operate under Russian Russian government that so uh, the all of today in Russia we they have no real independent media channel news channels or independent independent TV channels that uh, so all of them are the part of this propaganda even when we talk about some entertaining channels for example TNT or TNT plus blah blah blah, blah they 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 the Russian propaganda is uh, spreading uh, through the not only through the news but also through the, some comedies, some some uh, cultural uh, content, through the all the content, especially through the uh, news and movies, especially. And uh, the same situation is in other uh, Central Asia countries. For example, uh, regarding to the uh, research conducted by Internews and its partners in uh, Central Asia. Uh, now eight, eight channels out of ten uh the most popular channels in uzbekistan and kazakhstan and also russian tv channels so the, the, the russian propaganda is spreading very very widely uh do all in all the territories of the south uh, central asia it's the one way how uh, the russian propaganda influences the people and the population of the central asia but the, the another the, the second way is uh, this so-called new speak thanks to George Orwell, who invented this uh, word, I think. Uh, and the new speak is very interesting because even the local media in all our countries, they use, uh, for example, uh, the clap instead of explosion, uh, the special military operation instead of war, or uh, goodwill gesture instead of uh, withdrawal of troops of russian troops on previously occupied uh, cities of ukraine uh i i prepared a list of the the, the sound uh, glossary of this new speak and it and you can uh see this word see this phrases all around uh, our countries in a, even in some uh, independent independent media, they are not a part of the Russian propaganda. Maybe, but maybe some sometimes they even uh, didn't understand that they are becoming uh, some helpers of this Russian propaganda, and they help to spread this Russian propaganda among the among the people. For example, some some years ago, it was the uh, before the uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine. Uh, Putin uh, calls uh, sex workers in Russia as women with a low level of social responsibility. And the same phrase uh, I see on some uh, Uzbekistani and Tajikistani media, it, uh, uh, both of them are uh, independent media, but why they try to use this uh, kind of phrases uh, instead of, for example, sex workers, which is most popular, the most appropriate uh, uh, terminology for uh, this uh, group of people, but they use it. They, of course, uh, use all other uh, special terminology of newspeak, for example, uh, uh, negative growth instead of uh, recession, uh, denazification, demilitarization instead of war and attack on Ukraine, uh, liberation of Ukraine instead of occupation of Ukraine, and so on. So it's uh, two 
two, uh, two kind of strategies. One strategy is uh, using these telechannels to uh, influence the people, not only in Russia, but also in Central Asia. And the second way is spreading this news speak among the journalists, among the bloggers, among the all other uh, content creators in our, in our countries to influence, influence our audience. And uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, if you can, if, if you want, I can share with you this uh, research, the result, the report on this, this research, and you can see yourself that uh, <clears throat> how much, uh, how much our people, uh, I can say that they infected by the Russian propaganda, because uh, this Russian propaganda they uh, made people to 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 support Russian invasion into Ukraine. They support uh, this uh, uh, idea of Russian world, so-called Russia, Russian world, and Ruski Mir among the people. They, even if they not understand what does it exactly means, they they support it. Uh, the another way how the Russian and Russian propaganda, of course, uh, influence our people. It they influence it through our labor migrants who are uh, uh, in Russia. They work in Russia. Uh, just, just, just today, I read the news that uh, a lot of Tajik to, uh, labor migrants they work in Mariupol on uh, some repairing construction works, and uh, they are talking about that uh, Russian uh, this uh, building companies they don't pay their salary in uh, full amount of the uh, and uh, so they believe they believe to Russia they they affected by this Russian propaganda. And one is effect of this Russian propaganda, they believe into, uh, in Russian uh, leadership, Putin, government. Then if uh, even among the journalists, we have a lot of people who really believe they don't, uh, they don't uh, know what Russia exactly do. They don't want to see what Russia exactly do. They want just believe that it's, uh, it's on the true way, way that is on the right way. I, I'm sorry, and uh, the uh, Ukraine is really full of Nazis and fascists, and uh, the Russia is really liberate the people of Ukraine from this uh, Nazi government. Well, I think I I can over here and uh, the floor you are thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rustam. Thank you very much. That was a brilliant speech of yours. Uh, I really enjoyed all the dictionary that you were using, all the all the vocabulary, uh, the new uh, new uh, new speak that they are using. And yeah, my 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 personal favorite is the one where you, when they are selling that the jet, the the fighter jet, for example, that it didn't fall down, it negatively ascended, which is just a <laughs> oxymoron of the of the, of the, the one of the best oxymorons of this year for me. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, and I think it's very important that you stress this uh, sort of Orwellian uh, nature of the dystopian world that we are, as like that the whole world are uh, living right now. I mean, those world, the world which is definitely under the Russian influence, the the world where they are trying to add the additional word Russian to it before uh, expanding their uh, informational narratives. And I think it's important in such a situation to stop sometimes and reflect on what is going on, what is going on in, the, in our heads, what is going on with our media. And uh, I hope that the next speaker will help us uh, out with this, with the reflection. Uh, I give the floor to Dr. Farhot uh, Talipov, who is the director of the Education and Research Institution Knowledge Caravan, uh, who will share the lessons learned from propaganda's impact on Uzbekistan. Uh, you will have 10 minutes. Uh, yes, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dmitry. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, IWPR. Uh, all colleagues for having me in this very interesting uh, conversation, very interesting uh, discussion of uh, actually very sensitive uh, issue. Uh, and uh, the more we discuss uh, information sphere, cyber attacks, uh, propaganda, things like that, the more we, uh, me personally, I find that it's not only sensitive, delicate, but also so complicated, so sophisticated. And uh, sometimes I find myself so confused about, uh, as Dmitry uh, said a few minutes uh, ago, what's going on in our countries, how, uh, what, 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 we, what we receive from uh, different information channels, from propaganda channels, and how we should react. So, uh, well, uh, probably 
uh, it's not so easy to, you know, talk uh, to speak after previous uh, speakers uh, because uh, actually I share all of the views and points which were expressed by previous uh, speakers. That's why I will just uh, maybe uh, squeeze my uh, presentation and just express several theses in brief. Uh, well, uh, the topic, as you know, uh, uh, is information attack and information defense uh, and lessons from Uzbekistan. So uh, before giving uh, a couple of examples uh, from Uzbekistan or about Uzbekistan, maybe I will just uh, you know, share with you uh, some of uh, my conceptual um, you know, vision uh, just uh, today uh, in my lectures with uh, stu uh, for students in the university, we discussed this uh, very uh, issue and, uh, you know, uh, I, I uh, discussed with them three types of uh, information which we consume every day. Uh, by three types of information, I mean full and right information, first category, right but not full. It's like a dosed or limited, reduced information can be right, can be okay, but not full. And disinformation. Are we ready? Are we uh, well prepared to distinguish uh, uh, between them? Um, which type of information we receive every day, every minute, uh, and uh, can we, you know, make distinction? It's not easy. It's not easy even for professionals. Uh, that's why the environment, information environment uh, nowadays is getting more and more um, complicated, and the tools which are used spreading different type of information are so sophisticated that's why uh, it requires uh, you know great skill uh, qualification preparedness uh, and even morality to uh, you know um, first distinguish between these three types uh, on one hand and uh, uh, use the uh, you know proper adequate tools for reaction well uh when uh, uh, we discuss uh, um, information attacks or propaganda, probably I will just briefly uh, indicate also uh, three levels of uh, this process. One is uh, official information attack or official propaganda from adversary, let's say, symbolically adversary. And the second level, unofficial attack or unofficial propaganda uh, from adversary and, uh, you know, uh, self-targeted propaganda, I would say, uh, from consumers themselves, let's say, from, from our own countries, from uh, government and uh, media, local media and ordinary people. Well, uh, when, when, I, when I mean uh, official attacks, I mean statements um, of, uh, from, from uh, made by state leaders like Putin uh, and other officials uh, like Lavrov and others uh, or state affiliated uh, or pro-governmental uh, agencies which also spread some information make some uh, statements these are uh, th th these kind of activities can be called official propaganda or official information attack made you know uh, or spread from the just centers from uh, Kremlin let's say or from Moscow they are uh, official um sometimes uh not sometimes i would say always this official propaganda is so um uh, aggressive and uh you know sometimes even uh, more dangerous uh, more troublesome than unofficial attacks or unofficial propaganda because uh i can give you a little bit later uh some examples for instance uh, uh, officials use mentoring tone warnings official warnings uh, intimidation uh, and also uh, sending uh, fake news uh, and so on. Uh, 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 one of the uh, manifestations of these official attacks uh, are reflected uh, is reflected uh, in uh, Putin's speech one day before uh, uh, invading uh, Ukraine, um, based on uh, revision of history. Within one hour uh, speech, uh, he just revised completely the history of the Soviet Union. This was also uh, a manifestation or the example of official attack. Unofficial attacks made by uh, propaganda channels, uh, as we discussed today, uh, you know, some uh, think tanks, uh, expert community, media people uh, organize different uh, campaigns to spread, uh, you know, uh, specifically prepared uh, myths or fake news. Um, so they use TV shows 
as we know, and so on and so on. Like uh, Solovyov's uh, talk shows, or Skabeva's uh, talk shows, etc. cetera. Uh, well, um, there is also interesting uh, level uh, for our consideration. Uh, it's self-targeted propaganda. What I mean by self-targeted propaganda or self-targeted attack <laughs> even, uh, I mean, local experts, for instance, in our country, uh, themselves uh, contribute to this propaganda. Uh, and uh, in unison, I would say, with Russian propaganda. Probably uh, this situation is related to the existence of some visible or invisible group of interests uh, in our country for whom uh, such a uh, propaganda could be uh, beneficial, uh, or maybe they take advantage of uh, such a situation and so on. Uh, because I have uh, two, three minutes, maybe I will just share with you some of my uh, considerations uh, of concrete cases. For instance, um, some time ago, maybe uh, in the middle of uh, the military actions in Ukraine, I guess uh, as far as I remember, it was in summer this year, Ukrainian embassy uh, in Tashkent requested uh, the government of Uzbekistan to shut down the propaganda channels uh, because uh, according to uh, their request, uh, these channels uh, create biased uh, information situation uh, since uh, Uzbekistan doesn't uh, receive Ukrainian channels. Ukrainian TV doesn't broadcast uh, to Uzbekistan. We don't have Ukrainian propaganda here. And that's why TV uh, channels are overwhelmed uh, with uh, Russian-based uh, sources. That's why uh, this process creates uh, biased uh, information and, uh, you know, interprets the war in Ukraine um, wrongly. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Uzbek government didn't uh, respond and uh, the situation remains uh, unchanged. Uh, very often, uh, we, uh, you know, see some uh, information attacks or propaganda which are uh, saturated by some blackmail. For instance, uh, very often, uh, Russian media, and sometimes, as I said, self-targeted <laughs> interest groups uh, in Uzbekistan or media use or manipulate the issue of labor migrants, saying that because uh, more than one, one and a half million of labor migrants are working in Russia, uh, Uzbekistan is so exposed to Russian influence, and uh, that's why we have to be careful, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that's why uh, there is no resistance, let's say, to Russian propaganda. And sometimes uh, resistance is one thing, but also uh, there is um, support, official or unofficial support of uh, uh, Russian actions uh, in Ukraine. Uh, based on this, you know, uh, perception of vulnerability of uh, labor migrants working in, um, in Russia. Uh, another example, for instance, is uh, that, uh, you know, Several times, uh, the Speaker of uh, Foreign Affairs of uh, the Russian Federation, Maria Zakharova, made it ma made several, uh, you know, painful statements. I would say, or you know, unpleasant statements addressed to Uzbekistan. For instance, she mentioned uh, the uh, language policy, uh, the uh, you know, change of alphabet from Cyrillic to Latin, and things like that, saying that uh, it will create uncomfortable uh, conditions for. Uh, Russian speaking population in Uzbekistan and so on. The Minister of Foreign Affairs had to respond in this case uh, that it's internal affair of Uzbekistan and any statements like this made by Zakharova uh, is considered as the uh, interference into domestic affairs of you know, sovereign state, things like that. Well, um, and um, probably the last example, because I have no more time, uh, which also illustrate how official uh, Propaganda or official information attack, uh, you know, is uh, uh, it, you know is implemented. Uh, the, I mean, the recent visit by the Speaker of uh, State Duma, uh, Vyacheslav Valodin, uh, to Tashkent just a few days ago. Uh, this was really a very illustrative case to demonstrate how official propaganda and uh, information attack uh, is used. Uh, by an official, by high ranking, top ranking uh, official. And during the visit, uh, he made a statement, uh, which was quite provocative, quite, I would even say, you know, aggressive in terms of 
how he warned us, warned uh, Uzbekistan about, uh, yeah, I know, Dmitry, uh, uh, about the cooperation of Uzbekistan with the United States. A couple of uh, theses from his statement. Uh, this statement is available in the website, official website of Gosduma uh, as well. So he said that Uzbek population, Uzbekistani population is wise enough uh, to understand uh, the overall consequences of their cooperation with the United States. How would you understand this statement? Uzbek population is wise enough to understand well the overall consequences of uh, cooperation, Uzbekistan's cooperation with the United States. Is it a message? It is. Is it warning? It is. Is it's a kind of a uh, you know mentoring tone? Absolutely. And another example from his statement, just last one. Uh, he said that um, Americans pursue their own selfish interests in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan, and uh, uh, in the end of the day, overall cooperation with the United States. Uh, he said. Uh, will will destroy our conservative traditions, traditional values, and even families. So, means that hey guys, Uzbeks do not cooperate with the United States at all. <laughs> this is just the illustration, the example how this high-ranking official uh, uses special language, mentoring tone, trying to teach us with whom Uzbekistan should cooperate, with whom it should not. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Parhot. Uh, many interesting cases that you brought to the light and to our discussion. Uh, I think it is now time uh, to, to, to reflect on the whole overall uh, procedure of our discussion today. So let me just uh, make a very small uh, rapid recap, and then we, we move to the questions and answers. So we started today with the very uh, detailed uh, and uh, deep take of Anthony Borden on the propaganda on the pro Russian propaganda on the narratives on that then we proceeded to listen about the uh, types and different uh, categories of those narratives which were presented by Rashid Gabdul Hakov then Christopher Schwartz made a more technical take on what is where propaganda can look like in the 21st century and then Rustam Gulov shared his wonderful observations about the, the work of propaganda in Tajikistan and then we uh, thought about what are the impacts uh, of uh, um, the propaganda on the uh, politics, on the society in Uzbekistan. Uh, the last speaker, Farhot Talipov, presented these questions. So now I would like to address all the guests of our uh, event today. Uh, I will speak both in English and Russian. Please feel free to uh, ask questions by putting them in the chat. Пожалуйста, если у вас есть вопросы, обязательно в порядке, пожалуйста, пользуйтесь чатом и отправляйте свои вопросы здесь. Мы их обязательно озвучим. So we have already here the question from Christopher addressed to uh, Farhot, <coughs> sorry, to Farhot Talipov. So he is asking uh, to confirm uh, the, the very systematic overview of the framework about the information. So uh, he's asking whether there are three kinds of information, which is full and right information, then right, but not necessarily full information, and mis or disinformation, which can be classified as propaganda. And what are the levels of this propaganda, whether we can classify it into official, unofficial, self-targeted, other targeted, or audience generated. And he also proceeds with his question which can be found in the uh in in the chat that uh, maybe there is an additional meso level of journal journalist generated propaganda and he he provides here the examples of the uh cases of fox news republican party in the united states and possibly M msnbc democrat party in the u.s so uh it's a very uh <laughs> big question i would say but maybe you have some observation about it or maybe christopher can also turn on his mic and make some clarification it's actually, um, it's not just in the United States. I mean, um, until the current events in Ukraine, um, many of the more propagandistic elements of the Russian media escape would also act autonomously. It was also a bit of a throw spaghetti on the wall strategy too, to see what would stick in terms of messaging as well. So that was one of the things that's very interesting is that um, when we think about Russia as an authoritarian state, we have to not have romantic images of how that works. It's not, and until recently, it was not this hyper-centralized entity, but it actually was rather decentralized in how it was operating. So that's why I was thinking to what extent there were also, are also the professional journalists themselves, generators of, of um, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, however we want to define it. Uh, 
and the question you was still addressed to Farhot, right? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to confirm his framework and also to say if he would agree that there is this additional um, level among the mm -hmm. other levels, of course. Uh, if you mean uh, the audience and state. Yeah, Chris, if you mean uh, the, uh, how journalists generate uh, this information or disinformation, uh, is it about a journalist's own uh, role in this, in this process? I mean, uh, yes, uh, journalists, uh, if, for instance, uh, we mean uh, journalists, media workers, for instance, uh, in our case from uh, Russia, uh, Solovyov himself is journalist, so media correspondent, let's say TV correspondent, Precisely. they are informal, not official, they are unofficial. Anyway, uh, so it's it's broad. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. It's a broad okay. category. Okay. Uh, broad when, category. when we Got mean it. when we mean local journalists, of course, uh, depends on if they uh, are working in unison with Russian propagandists. It means they are self-targeted because they target our own audience audience uh, because consumers are here in uh, in Uzbekistan and Uzbek journalists uh, are uh, targeting uh, Uzbek journalists are targeting uh, Uzbek local consumers. So they are self self they are you know, fulfilling the work of self-targeting. Uh, self -target but there are other journalists also, uh, among others uh, in Uzbekistan as well. Uh, I mean, those independent journalists uh, or media sphere, even uh, affiliated with the state, also like TV channels, who are, but of course, very rarely, because uh, it's not, you know, the liberal state or uh, democracy, but uh, from time to time, when it's relevant, even uh, state of uh, state of affiliated uh, media and independent media from time to time criticize, do criticize some uh, very ugly, you know, uh, or aggressive or you know, uh, intimidating statements made by uh, people like Volodin. So in in such cases, they do react. For instance, a couple of days ago, um, I was interviewed by local uh, media. Uh, and, uh, you know, I responded to different questions uh, related to Volodin's visit to Uzbekistan and tried to express my uh, critical views about uh, this statement. Uh, and uh, so in this case, you know, media plays the role of, I don't know, it's not self-targeting, <laughs> but uh, probably another category or something in between. But nevertheless, they are uh, like maybe counter propaganda level or, you know, Taking uh, resistance, I mean, uh, resistance measures to uh, towards adversary. Uh, anyway, uh, this is how it works, I, I guess. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Cecilia for uh, Rashid. Uh, and of course, other experts, if they can join, uh, reflecting upon the audience's uh, vulnerability connected to socio cultural economical spheres, what are the cost effective practices that are uh, demonstrated to significantly decrease audiences' vulnerabilities? Is fact checking sufficient? Cecilia wonders. Do we need more or less tailored or globally targeted approaches? So there are different categories of people who are susceptible to propaganda yeah, impacts. So we can talk about categories uh, in terms of digital literacy or media literacy in general. So older generation, people who are sitting in front of TV and are perceiving everything that is um, broadcast on traditional media as the truth. But then we have another layer of, of, of people. And uh, in my previous research, I studied the impact on of disinformation on our labor migrants in Russia. And there the perception, uh, the role of community leaders is huge. So people turn into thematic groups online for the truth. Yeah. So these informal leaders online, sometimes they're a religious figure. Sometimes they are the person who helps people migrate to Russia. So this informal guru, this person, they are responsible for the narrative to which people are exposed to online because they can weed out the discussion they can moderate the comments they can approve or disapprove members of the community so they become little you know heads of these mini kingdoms thematic kingdoms and people join these environments for practical reasons of course yeah? you want to move to russia you need your community to rely upon what documents do i need how do i enter where do i find the job what are the permits and if we think about it if these environments are sources of disinformation, if properly addressed and work with, 
they can become sources of good information. So if there are strategies to construct counter narratives, alternative messages, then these environments, these online milieus, these thematic groups must be taken into consideration, must be taken into account. And the work has to be done simultaneously because it's the media and digital literacy courses that need to start from childhood, but also not limited there because we also need to work with the older generation of people who have the time to go and vote, for instance. Yeah, so they also impact decision-making and um, I will leave it there. So multifaceted digital literacy, but also working with the informal leaders as sources of destructive information, but also they can be turned into sources of good information. To add to that, so not only am I a journalist, but I, my PhD is in philosophy. So um, I, uh, if I may talk in grandiose terms, um, we have to distinguish between uh, fundamental susceptibilities of the, of the human mind to things like, to phenomena like propaganda, uh, and then specific conditions that then expand or contract on that susceptibility, right? We can't do much about the first, you know, the perennial, the perennial conditions of propaganda without changing what it means to be human, which is maybe not advisable. <laughs> um, but when it comes to the specific conditions of it, um, there's a lot to be done in terms of the platforms themselves, uh, as Rashid is pointing out. Um, but there is something that is very much within our power to do collectively, but we choose not to, which is to uh, try to mitigate precariousness in society. Um, there's a lot of good research by Joanna Bryson uh, that shows that uh, receptivity to uh, the kind of discourses that you see often see in propaganda uh, attends um, a real or perceived precariousness within the audience. And so the more in danger they feel in general or from a specific um, uh, threat, then the more likely they're going to they're going to they're going to consume such content. And whether they believe in it or not is is sort of a hard question to answer because it depends a bit of what you mean by believe. But certainly it will align with their feelings of of being endangered. Um, and this is one of the reasons why right now susceptibility to propaganda is universal, including in wealthy societies, because wealth is just not being distributed correctly. Um, uh, wealth is not distributed in an equitable fashion. Um, and I mean, having lived in Central Asia, I can, I can tell you that it's, uh, it's definitely not distributed equitably at all. So um, we can go ahead and try to deal, try to find technical solutions or try to teach people more and more, be more media literate or build detector tools and so on. But until we are willing to actually address the way our societies are structured and try to make people feel like they can have um, meaningful uh, and relatively safe lives without having to become billionaires in order to do so, um, then we're not really going to be able to address the problem. And we're just going to potentially even make it worse because we don't really know whether the algorithms we can use in social media platforms will have the uh, targeted effects that we want them to. We don't know if increased media literacy won't make people just more skeptical and more paranoid. There are actually signs that point that direction as well. They become less empowered and more just broadly critical. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we need, it's not, again, it's not that, it's not that figuring out the distribution of wealth will solve all the problems. You know, even a wealthy society like Germany right now, the news came out that there was a, a coup plot <laughs> by a bunch of very well-to-do right-wing extremists. So there will, there will always be some element of, of society that can get sucked into these black holes, but uh, it, it, it can only be mitigated ultimately at a collective level. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher. I see that uh, Anthony has also ha has his hand raised. I will give the floor just in one second because I have to make some housekeeping announcement. Uh, I'm being told that right now there will be a link uh, shared in the chat, which is the link to the feedback uh, form, which I encourage that uh, all the guests can follow and then share their uh, feedback with the organizers. I know IWPR Central Asia team very well, and I know they always learn. and. Uh, we heard the uh, a very fair point from Rashid Gabdul Hakov today about the uh, this this event, and I think it's uh, the organizers will learn from it and of course improve their work even further and uh, make new and better standards every time that they are doing some sort of events. So now I would like to give the floor to Anthony Borton, who has who had his uh, hand raised, and I guess he was going to answer the previous question. 
Sorry, there you go. I actually wanted to follow up from Christopher, just actually a follow on question, which is we are moving to this really vital issue of solutions. Um, because of our work, I'm often thinking about the relationship between credible information and trust and community and engagement, these kind of factors. Uh, old line journalism separated the production of, of, of content with social engagement. Then we had uh, you know, civic journalism, which sought to tie these things together. And now we have a new world where nobody knows where the lines are anymore. And that can obviously be dis uh, exploited and, and be disrupted. But, but especially given our work, we think that the links between civil society, local voices, the community that they serve can help be one of the factors that can address vulnerability and build trust and confidence in, in, in real information, uh, reliable information and so forth. And there's others who've made this point, Timothy Snyder has, has, has made this point about local journalism in general. And I just wondered what reflections on this theme any of our uh, very brilliant and thoughtful panelists or, or participants or otherwise may, or Dimitri, anyone may bring to this question that I brood about a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe somebody has a comment on that. Well, you, I mean, we're talking about also in your case, con uh, conditions of conflict, right? So um, the human mind is very good at distinguishing between what's sometimes called intelligence and intellect. So intelligence is the, the, the implementability of something and, and intellect is the more creative element of it, right? So um, when in the conditions of conflict, we tend to gravitate towards real information that is intelligent, that is implementable, but we don't necessarily want information that causes us to question our categories, right? Especially because we feel that we are, we're in danger, we have to fight, right? So uh, the, the goal has to be effectiveness. So quote unquote, real information um, is not necessarily uh, uh, ignored under conditions of conflict. It's just that certain kinds of real information are prioritized and other ones are deprioritized or marginalized, right? It's a very, it's the very rare kind of conflict situation in which one, one or the other parties is willing to have more intellectual information, but again, they may want that for the long-term goal of still winning, right? And so in the Cold War, this was the unusual American governmental strategy and that the US government was more or less susceptible to having its very categories challenged because somehow they got persuaded that this would make them more effective in winning the Cold War, right? But you know, in you know, when, when Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are having a border clash, you know, they're not going to be concerned about basically whether the border is something that was, so to speak, manufactured by the Soviet era, or you know, uh, what does it mean to be Tajik or Kyrgyz, and do we, do we actually want to be doing this as fellow Central Asians? That's not going to be the that's not going to be the kind of information that they want to hear. You know, um, even historical information about how the border came about is is not going to be interesting for them. It's any it, they're going to cherry pick the information that is useful for them to win their side in the conflict, right? So I I don't know if the problem per se is a lack of receptivity to real information, but rather which real information actually gets filtered through um, by by the by the receiver. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, topic is very broad. I, it, it, the topic yeah. is very broad, but unfortunately, we don't have much time to discuss every little de detail. Uh, although I know that we have a lot of things to share here to say. Uh, so we have uh, two questions here in the chat. Uh, I will read them out loud, and then we can proceed to reflecting on our overall session. So we have the question to uh, Farhot Talipov from Nargiza Umarova. She's asking, uh, what uh, methods of countering the narrative of Russian propaganda should be activated in the conditions of Uzbekistan, and who should be doing that? Yes, very interesting. Uh... Uh, and uh, fundamental questions are uh, question I would say because uh, today we just discussed uh, what what is the real case okay what we get uh, from uh, propaganda channels everything what are the threats and the technical aspects but we didn't touch uh, the issue of how we should respond to uh, such threats and challenges and uh, I think uh, I can um, uh, you know suggest for future discussion maybe a couple of further uh, following. Uh, you know, moments uh, uh, in in a sense how uh, we sh uh, in terms of how we should uh, react or respond. First of all, I think uh, we should 
continue discussing uh, the issue of shutting down Russian uh, propaganda channels. Uh, actually, I have to, uh, you know, bring some clarity to this issue because uh, very often we pronounce this thesis, shutting down or blocking of Russian propaganda channels. I don't mean channels, I mean just programs because uh, we have uh, dozens of uh, Russian channels which are normal, which are okay, acceptable, no propaganda there at all, sport, National Geographic, or news, normal news, and everything else, uh, Zvezda, NTV, or ORT, uh, cinemas. I mean, uh, only blocking uh, just one hour talk show, for instance, of Salaviyov. When Salaviyov switches on, uh, on TV, uh, I think, uh, during this one hour talk show of Salavio Oscar Bieva in the NTV, only for this one hour, let's say national TV, our national TV can, uh, you know, switch something local like uh, cartoon films or whatever, okay, or sport, whatever. And when Salavio finishes his propaganda, the channel continues working. I mean, such a measure would hardly irritate Russia uh, and uh, well, because we can say, hey, Russia, the situation is a little bit biased. We, when we voted in the UN, uh, uh, you know, when uh, the uh, Russian uh, side was blamed for aggression, Uzbekistan was neutral. We didn't, uh, you know, uh, express any position. We were neutral, okay? So if uh, we are neutral, let's express neutrality uh, every time. It means that uh, in this case, we just do not broadcast, we do not accept any propaganda uh, things uh, from Russian TV, and uh, that's it. This will create some kind of balance, balance uh, in the information sphere. So other Russian channels, other programs are broadcasted normally, easily, without any problem. This is one uh, measure, I guess. Uh, another one is uh, we, uh, I think I, I call this phenomenon complex of the weak states. I think we should we have to overcome the complex of the weak state. What I mean by complex of the weak state, I mean uh, very often local people, expert community, officials especially think uh, and every time articulate the issue that we are so weak in front of uh, or vis-a-vis -vis Russia or the United States or whoever. They are great powers. That's why we shouldn't. Uh, make them angry, we shouldn't uh, irritate them, we, should, we have to be careful, and that's why we shouldn't take any uh, steps which could irritate Russia. So a priori, a priori, they think that if we take some even modest measures, these measures can uh, irritate uh, the opposite side. That's why uh, it's, it's based uh, a priori on this complex, on this self-perception that we are weak. I think we have to overcome this complex of the uh, weak state. And the third, last one, I think uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, major steps uh, which we can uh, take is uh, the step uh, taken by, jointly by Central Asian uh, neighbors, Central Asian countries. Uh, now we are experiencing very important, very serious uh, process in Central Asia, uh, reunification, reintegration of Central Asian countries after the long, long break. And uh, I think uh, one of the uh, actual questions which are debated, discussed today, uh, within uh, Central Asian countries, especially uh, among experts, to create common information space, common information space, common TV, something like this. I think uh, if we elaborate on the common policy in the information sphere, probably this measure will make us stronger and will contribute to this uh, issue of overcoming the complex of the weak state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for hot. Now we are uh, ending up with the very last question here. I will just uh, give the floor maybe to Rustam Gulov, who can also help us with answering this question. And there is already the, the answer provided by Rashid to this question. So the question is uh, from Nafisa. What is the reason for the high rate of Russian news TV channel consumption in Central Asia? Is it based only on co common cultural heritage or is it possible that there is not enough good quality content in, in the region? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think there is two factors of uh, the, the popularity of this Russian uh, propaganda here. The first factor, of course, the, the quality of the content, because uh, in, in compare of uh, our national uh, uh, media outlets content, it's uh, really in very high level. But uh, the second one is, um, I think it's the most important because Russian propaganda, they um, they don't uh, give you a chance to think about the situation by giving a fact. They uh, formulate 
uh, a problem and then uh, formulate a solution of this problem. They give you a problem and they, they name the problem and they, and they give you a solution to this problem. So you don't have to think about the situation. You don't have to gather the fact, collect the facts and uh, critically think about the, all of them. You just watch the TV, uh, just uh, consume this uh, news, just uh, see what is the most problem, the most important problem for, like, for example, LGBT propaganda is the most uh, important pro problem in Russia if you watch the Russian TV. And the solution is uh, banning this propaganda. So uh, everybody is happy. Uh, the problem is uh, formulated by the Russian propaganda and the solution is uh, ready to use. So, so the, this is, the, I think, the most important, the, the most uh, important uh, factor why, why the Russian propaganda is so influencing the people. Thank you very much, Rustam. Uh, on this uh, note, I would like to wrap the things up. And I must admit that today's discussion showed many important and diverse aspects of the existing uh, problem of the pro-war propaganda and the impact it has on Central Asia. Uh, well, uh, I would like to, before closing everything, I would also like to point to this article which I read. Uh, it is authored by Abba Khon Sultan Azarov, uh, who is the IWPR Central Asia Regional Director, and by uh, Sergei Marinin, an independent analyst, uh, where they were talking about, the article was titled, "When will, will we see uh, really sovereign Central Asia? And there they were arguing about uh, and analyzing all the political trends, political developments in the region. But what our meeting that did today, it complements the narrations like that. It complements further because it allows us to touch something intangible, something that it doesn't have the, 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 the physical flesh uh, representation and some the ideational factors that we that are in our heads and that just like memes are spreading across the population. So and the the 2022 and the war in Ukraine, it really showed the, how important these intangibles are. And I'm glad that today we managed to unveil the court and, and look at the battlefield that is taking places in our heads, in our minds. Uh, I also would like to make an additional observation about the networking. I really enjoyed the uh, suggestion of Christopher to cooperate with other uh, speakers who were talking today. So uh, I think this our meeting today also had another practical impact. Uh, I, th I thank all our speakers for being here with us tonight. Uh, thank you for your time. I understand that everybody is very busy, but you found the time to uh, speak about this important issue. And we are sure, I'm sure that the, the, this discussion brings the changes, at least in our minds, uh, at least in the minds of the, those people listening to us. I hope that you all enjoyed uh, our today's event, and the panel highlight will be published on Kabar.Asia platform following tonight's event, and the video will be uploaded to you on YouTube channel, which is great. This is just the comment that I was writing in the chat. <laughs> uh, look it up, of course, put the uh, like, uh, uh, put the like and hit the bell button and share with your friends. Also, don't forget to explore our, the Kabar.Asia a media school platform where you can find the courses about the, of, of fighting the disinformation and many other important topics too. Uh, before signing off, I, I would like to remind that there is also the link to the feedback form. Please feel free to use it. Stay tuned and for such expert meetings down the road, please also follow the social media of uh, IWPR and Kabar.Asia for uh, being, in, uh, being up to date with the upcoming events. Thank you so much for your participation. It was a pleasure. Dimitri, one thing, when you publish it, can you also make sure you have a very sketchy sponsorship at the beginning, like landed titles or whichever one was involved in this recent controversies? Hit the bell, like and subscribe and go see this totally, totally untrustworthy sponsor. For... <laughs> then you will have YouTube perfection. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I hope that the uh, organizers are taking note of that. that thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they better. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.